tonight, are you one of Britain's secret drinkers? Right, Gillian, I've got something I'd like to show you. <laughs> oh, gosh. This is what you are drinking every week. Oh, my God. It just looks such a lot when you see it all together. It is an awful lot of wine. And how a few glasses of wine can quickly add up. Around about a quarter of the UK population are drinking more than they should. Someone drinking half a bottle of wine at night is at risk of liver disease, and there's a hell of a lot of people in that category. Good evening and welcome to the Tonight programme. Health experts are warning that a growing number of people are putting their health at risk by regularly drinking one or two glasses of wine in the evening, often to relax and unwind after work. In tonight's programme, Fiona Foster charts the rise in home drinking and looks at the impact it's having on the nation's health in Britain's secret drinkers. Britain's binge drinking culture is the scourge of towns and cities across the country and a source of national shame. The government has spent millions trying to curb this sort of behaviour and reduce the strain it puts on both the police and the health service. This is Britain's big drink problem. Or is it? According to the experts, there's another drinking phenomenon that's developed in recent years and one which has the potential to be even more damaging to our health. And that's the growing popularity of home drinking. According to a recent study, more and more people are drinking at home on a regular basis. In some cases, every night of the week. For some, it's a reward after a long day at work. For others, it's seen as a way of unwinding. The report says there's a common misconception that this sort of drinking is safe. I think regular home drinking in the UK is actually a massive problem, but it's difficult to tackle it when it's behind closed doors and people are in, so far in denial that they're not willing to um, talk about it. I have absolutely seen it move from being something for special occasions, from something you do maybe at the weekend, to something people consider is a normal part of their life. They would no more dream of going to the supermarket without stocking up on wine than they would going to the supermarket and not getting bread and milk. Gillian Logan is a successful businesswoman. She works long hours as a management consultant in the food industry and frequently commutes into London from her home in Bedford. It's a stressful job and Gillian says she usually unwinds with a few glasses of wine in the evening. So at what age did you start enjoying a drink? I think I didn't really start paying that much attention to alcohol or, or thinking about drinking alcohol until I was 35. And I'd, before that, I'd maybe had the odd glass of wine when I went out, but I wasn't really that bothered whether I had a drink or not. It was through work mainly. I would start going to work functions and also entertaining and got introduced to much nicer wines and things like that. And I started to really enjoy a nice glass of wine and gradually started drinking more and more without even realising it. So when it comes to your drinking habits then, how often are you drinking and how much would you say? I've got into the habit now of buying a couple of the little mini bottles and enjoying those on the train on the way home because uh, it helps me relax. And I feel like I deserve it at the end of the day. And then I'll walk back from the station and by that time I think, oh, well, I might as well open a bottle of wine, have a glass. And before I know it, I've usually finished the whole bottle. I am conscious that I'm drinking more than is healthy for me, but uh, I, I don't necessarily count it up every day. If I did, it would probably scare me. <laughs> Gillian says she's no different to many other people. She admits she probably drinks more than she should, but says she doesn't have a drink problem. She's agreed to let us monitor her intake over the course of a week. I think it's very common that people, uh, not just the young people, but people my age, do go home and have a glass of wine or, or a drink of some sort to relax. They might look at binge drinkers and think, oh, that's terrible, but 
are drinking excessive amounts of alcohol and it just you know you see it on Facebook all the time you know oh I've had a hard day I'm going to have a glass of wine yeah I deserve a glass of wine now I think it's very common Gillian is concerned that her 17 year old daughter Heather has started to comment on how often and how much her mum drinks my daughter about a year ago she did say to me you know you'd seem to be drinking a lot more at home and she was she was a little bit concerned and I just said to her, look, it's fine, you know, I'm, I'm OK, I'm not turning into an alcoholic or anything. Yeah, that red top is really nice. What worried me is that I was perhaps being a bad influence on her. I didn't want her to think that it was the norm to drink regularly. But according to many in the medical profession, this sort of regular drinking is fast becoming the norm. People in the UK like a drink. I mean, you know, pretty much everybody, you know, enjoys enjoys alcohol. Um, and around about a quarter of the UK population are drinking more than they should. And about 10% of the UK population are drinking more than twice as much as the government suggests they do. Someone drinking half a bottle of wine at night is at risk of liver disease. And there's a hell of a lot of people in that category. While thousands of pubs have closed in the last few years, drinking at home has become increasingly popular and now accounts for half of all alcohol sales in the UK. It's a trend that all began back in the 60s and 70s. From the quiet charm of genuine Tudor to the busy life on a modern housing estate, there's one service all can enjoy. Davenport's Beer at Home service. The brewing companies realised there was a whole new market to be tapped by getting their products into the homes of the middle classes. I've got to stay and clean the uh, badger's cage. Got to meet the new uh, book uh... Depending on the class that you were or your status, you would have either gone out to drink alcohol to the alehouse, the pub. If you have money, you would be more likely to be drinking at home. You'd be entertaining at home. So alcohol at home will be part of your daily life. Long Life was the first beer brewed expressly to be drunk at home. So, whatever it is that brings you home, Long Life's the beer to come home to. But home drinking really began to take off with our developing taste for wine. And that, according to alcohol historian Jane Payton, was all down to the popularity of foreign holidays. In the 1960s, we started going on package holidays. The price of holidays was reduced dramatically. People started getting passports and going overseas on these fairly cheap holidays, and most of them were going to sunny Spain. They were going to the costas, where they were drinking sangria. It might have been the first experience they'd ever had of drinking wine, but they were drinking different things. And so suddenly their lives were opened up to a different possibility of alcohol, and they liked it. And it was fun. Coming home, they wanted to recreate that happiness of the holiday. So people started to drink wine. Adverts like this showed how drinking at home had become something that was considered sophisticated, even aspirational. Where are you truly wafted here from paradise? No, look near, Paul. But it seems there was a clash between that adopted continental habit of wine with every meal and our own genetic tendency to binge. We've combined our feast drinking mentality, if you like, our Celtic and Northern European feast drinking mentality that we've had for thousands of years with an imported continental culture of drinking on a daily basis with meals, you know. So it's not just a question of going home on a Friday night and opening a bottle of wine to celebrate a hard one week, but it's going home on a Monday night and opening a bottle of wine to celebrate a hard one Monday. And, and that's when the difficulties really start, I think. University administrator Lucy Rocker was a young mum living in Sheffield when she developed the habit of drinking at home. She says her friends were doing the same and there didn't seem anything wrong with it. I don't think I ever really had any um, reasons for drinking heavily in the... Um, I wasn't really running away from anything, it was just more... It was culturally normal and it was what my peers did, so I just did it because everybody else did. the way people drink in this country the sort of habitual nightly bottle of wine it becomes so habitual that you don't notice the impact it's having on you 
Lucy says her own drinking had become habitual and that it helped her cope with a crisis in her life. When I was in my late 20s, I got divorced and I was a single parent um, and I really struggled to cope with the loneliness and um, I was quite depressed and so I started drinking then to alleviate loneliness, boredom and depression, self-medicating really. Then, two and a half years ago, Lucy's drinking came to a dramatic end. On a night in April 2011, I drank on my own when my daughter was at her dad's um, three bottles of wine. Um, I never had an off switch, so I didn't think I was drunk. I felt perfectly in control. I obviously wasn't. Um, took the dog uh, outside to the toilet at about 10 o'clock, um, and the next thing I knew, I woke up in hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning, um, and I'd passed out on the pavement. I had a complete memory blackout, had no idea what had happened and was terrified. So that was my big wake-up call and I never had a drink after that. Since then, Lucy has set up a social networking site for women worried they're drinking too much. The fact that it has attracted more than 15,000 members in its first year tells its own story. Everybody who comes on to Sober Easters thinks it's just them. So they've been hiding this problem away, really ashamed and guilt-ridden for years and years, um, sneakily drinking, often behind the husband's back and, and hiding bottles and things. Um, and then there's this huge relief when they realise that it's not just them, and there's a lot of people out there. When Lucy looks back on her own experience, she says she went from enjoying alcohol to relying on it. But recognising when regular drinking has become a dependency can be difficult. People have this view of alcohol dependency as a black or white thing. They think in terms of someone being an alcoholic. And I'm not an alcoholic, you know, clearly. You know, it's, not, it's nothing to do with me. Pretty much all the patients who come and see me who I identify as drinking to excess have a picture in their mind of what constitutes problem drinking or alcoholism. Funnily enough, it's always a different pattern of drinking from theirs. So the little old lady who tipples from the sherry bottle at 11 o'clock in the morning thinks she doesn't have a problem because she's not going out and getting drunk and throwing up on street corners. The person who goes out once a week and gets completely legless doesn't think they have a problem because they can get through the week without drinking. Lots of people are on the spectrum of dependency without recognising it. And probably the best way to find out if you're on the scale of dependency is to see how easy it is to cut out the booze for, for two or three days of the week. And if you find that really a problem, then that is a suggestion that actually alcohol has become much more important to you than it should be. And that's all that dependency is. In a survey commissioned by Tonight, Net Mums has questioned more than 1,700 parents about their drinking habits. Of those who drank, 80% said they did so at home. One in five said they had a drink three or four times a week. One in 20 said they drank pretty much every day. Back with businesswoman Gillian, we've been keeping an eye on her unit consumption for the past week. Remember, the recommended intake is no more than 21 units a week for a man and 14 for a woman. So how much has Gillian been getting through? Right, Gillian, I've got something I'd like to show you. <laughs> Oh gosh. <laughs> okay. This is what you are drinking every week. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, that is quite a lot of wine, isn't it? I mean, that is the equivalent of seven bottles of wine. So that's a bottle of wine a night. Gosh, and I'm and probably drinking more than that yeah, as well. Yeah, you tell me you occasionally drink more than that. And can you guess how many units of alcohol there are in that lot. I know that that's got to be about 70 units of alcohol and that's way over. Recommended for a woman maximum a week I think is 14. So you're drinking kind of more than that a night really. Yeah, oh my gosh. You seem genuinely surprised by it. It just looks such a lot when you see it all together. And I also think, why am I not 20 stone when I'm drinking this much? Well, life? funny you mention that because <laughs> In this, there's approximately four and a half thousand calories. Oh my God, that is a lot of calories. That's almost enough to put me off, <laughs> just really? that alone. 
four and a half thousand calories is more than two days worth of intake for the average woman. So all this will be having an impact on Gillian's weight. But what are those units doing to her health? She agrees to undergo liver tests in order to find out. And we'll see how she gets on later. Now, Gillian isn't alone here. It seems that one of the biggest problems with home drinking is that it's hard to keep track of exactly how much you're consuming. Back in the 80s, it all seemed very simple. A glass of wine was a unit, a pint of beer, two. But since then, two things have changed. Some drinks have got stronger, and as far as wine goes, measures have got bigger. Back in the 70s, most popular wine brands averaged 9% alcohol content. Today, most are between 12 and 14%. This is the old style wine measure, 125 millilitres. And this is the large wine glass commonly in use today, 250 millilitres, exactly double. Combine that with a stronger alcohol content, and what you're looking at is not one unit of alcohol, but three. And that trend towards stronger wines seems set to continue, with New World producers in particular striving to sell us a much higher alcohol content. Look at places like Argentina, for example, um, where in some instances I feel that quality is just automatically associated with, with alcoholic strength. Um, it's the sort of spinal tap, turn it up to 11 routine. And so you get wines that are 15%, they're just massive, big powerhouses. I think there is a move towards actually people looking for something that is a little bit lighter. They, they do pay attention to the alcoholic content, there's no, no question. There are also those, of course, who come in and look for the heaviest and most alcoholic thing we've got. As a nation, we spend £30 billion a year on alcoholic drinks. But when you compare what's sold, to what we say we drink, over 40% of Britain's booze simply goes missing. And researchers are convinced that's because either we don't know, or we don't want to know, exactly what we're drinking. So what did your research show? Well, we're interested in this discrepancy between what people say they drink and what's actually sold. And if we take the missing units into account, um, among those who drank in the last week, we would see 80% of women and 75% of men drinking above the government's recommended daily limits. Why do you think people do underreport what they drink to such an extent? There is a social desirability. You don't want to say that you drink a lot. You think the researcher's going to judge you or something like that. But the two most important ones, I think, are probably just the idea of recall and remembering what you've actually had to drink and also this kind of understanding of how much alcohol is actually in drinks, how big is a glass of wine and things like that. The thing in the corner was full. <laughs> Gillian now knows the truth about her alcohol consumption. But what effect, if any, is it having on her health? Liver disease develops completely silently. There are no symptoms. The liver has no pain fibres in it. There's just absolutely no way of knowing that you would be developing liver disease. She arrives at the London Bridge Hospital for blood tests and a liver scan. The results will be analysed by one of the country's top liver specialists. Yeah, we're going to do a quick blood test, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's all right. What are your feelings about doing the test today? Well, I don't, the tests I'm not nervous about, but the results, yeah, I, you know, I'm conscious that I may be doing damage to myself, that I'm probably drinking more than is healthy, and so I think it's a good time to find out. A series of tests will analyse the chemicals that the liver is releasing into the bloodstream. Gillian is also undergoing a fibro scan. This is new technology which gives an early warning of any damage inside the liver. I'm conscious that I drink more than is healthy for me, but I don't feel like I've got a drink problem. But uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this because I thought it might help me go, you know what, you should take a look at how much you're drinking and, and cut back a little bit. Hi, Gillian. Lovely Hello, to see you Harrison. again. Come on, do come in. Thank you. Now for the moment of truth. I've got all your results back mm -hmm. so we can have a chat. Now, the first is your liver tests. 
Now, if I just show you these, the ratio of these showing that the AST is higher than the ALT would be a typical finding in someone who's got some liver inflammation due to drinking too much alcohol. Okay. Now, the fibre scan uh, measures the stiffness of your liver. Now, pleased to report that your liver stiffness measurement is 3.8, which is entirely normal. So although the liver is a bit inflamed, it is not yet scarred. But nevertheless, if you do not reduce the amount of alcohol you're drinking long term, you would be at danger, in danger long term, of getting uh, alcohol-related liver problems. It's a warning shot over the bowels, really, for her. Um, she should be able to do something about it. Um, it's really lifestyle, though, that she's got to address. What, um, I don't want to give up drinking completely, but what would you say I ought to do? The first thing you need to do is actually stop drinking alcohol for a period of time. And really, you have to stop drinking alcohol for a period of six months. Six months? Yeah. Okay. It's a sobering moment for Gillian. Was it a bit frightening to hear that? I'm glad that I found out now rather than later on when I'd seriously damaged it. So has it given you the motivation, do you think, to yeah. give up for a while? I have to do the six months, but I've got to be honest, in my head I'm thinking, right, I've got social engagements, I've got this, that and the other. When can I start my six months of not drinking? I know I need to do it, but that is going to be a bit challenging. Christmas is coming up, <laughs> New Year. She's got to think about what it is that she is doing that is leading her to, to drink this amount of alcohol. And she's drinking a harmful amount of alcohol. It is hazardous to her. If Gillian curbs her drinking habit now, her liver will repair and regenerate. But many people don't know the damage is done until it's simply too late. It would be very typical for people just to get symptoms of liver disease when their liver is at the point of packing up. And then that's too late. When I catch up with Gillian a couple of days later, she's had a chance to think about things and face up to what needs to be done for the sake of her health. What I should do from now, even from now, is, is stop drinking every day. I think that would be the right, most so sensible thing to do. Right, so cut down gradually and then yeah. stop. Yeah, I it's think... It's going to be tricky, though, that going cold turkey on it, isn't it, I think? I think... It, I suppose so. I just have to get out of the habit of it. I think it has just become quite a normal thing to just go oh, yeah I'll have a glass of wine treat myself relax um, I've worked hard today that kind of thing maybe I'll have a bar of chocolate instead or a cup of tea <laughs> after the Christmas celebrations will come the New Year's resolutions and for a lot of people cutting down on the booze will be top of the list according to the experts the first step on the road to responsible drinking is to face up to the truth. Be honest with yourself. If you go on somewhere like the Drink Aware website, you can actually work out brand by brand how much alcohol is in different brands. You don't have to tell your doctor what it is, but be honest with yourself. You really need to know how much you're drinking. Stop kidding yourself. <laughs>